The Heart Rhythm Society's 40th Annual Scientific Sessions in San Francisco, California are underway where members have come from all over the world to learn about the latest in electrophysiology. Heart Rhythm TV starts right now. Hello and welcome to day two of Heart Rhythm TV. I'm Dr. Kevin Campbell, ready to bring you everything you need to know from this year's scientific sessions. Today, we examine the important roles of our allied health professionals and highlight some of the organizations around the world that are dedicated to improving the care of patients with heart rhythm disorders. First though, an exclusive interview with the chairman of the advisory board for the Society of Worldwide Medical Exchange. Today, we're with Dr. Afonso Negri, who is the chairman of the board for the Worldwide Medical Exchange. Dr. Negri, welcome to the program. Thank you, thank you for having me here, yes. Tell me a little bit about the purpose and the mission of the Worldwide Medical Exchange. This was actually, my, uh, if you want to call it like that, my idea in 2008, when you know we, we wanted to take advantage of what the medical societies here in, in the United States would want like uh, uh, further medical education uh, through courses, to, through grants also. To, uh, and so the idea was to set up a, a, a company, something that we have done in Europe also since 2002, to have um, something completely unbiased, completely out of commercial support, you know, really uh, relying upon the ethical uh, principles much before the code of conduct were introduced. Well, in the beginning it was the idea to help people from poorer country or country un not developed like Africa. We had people from Ghana, we, had, uh, we started working with ADA, the diabetic uh, people and uh, diabetes, etc. And from Ghana, from Belize, from uh, Indonesia also. So we brought them here to the, to the States mm -hmm. to learn and then produce educational projects, educational programs, you know, that could benefit, you know, could put, put them online, and a lot of therapies and a lot of uh, pathologies, etc. So this was the basic, the basic uh, fundamentals of, of, of this SWME. So I've been on the board ever since, so, until they throw me out. <laughs> no, man. And we, we plan to do more. I know here at the Heart Rhythm Society, there's uh, uh, it's a good opportunity also to, to be involved in, and, you know, this is our, our scope and objective. So tell me a little bit about the collaboration that you foresee between your organization and the Heart Rhythm Society. We have been working um, as a non-for-profit organization for so many years, for 10 years at least. Uh, we are uh, used to to guarantee, if you want, you know, we really guarantee the, the the grants that we received can be passed on to the doctors or people that plan to attend this this meeting here. And this is something that you can you can really see that it's a, uh, it's a benefit in a way, you know, because if you, uh, I mean, I know in this com confused world, you know, where you don't know exactly uh, what is commercial, what's not commercial, we can stand as as people that are, you know, well, then we can help, I think. So let me ask you another question. There's a lot of us within the society, physicians yes. like me, who are interested in medical volunteerism. I went to Fiji for two years and sailed around and provided free medical care to remote islands. How can physicians like myself, who are members of our organization, get involved with your organization? Well, th this is a good, uh, good question. I think the thing, the best thing is to get involved directly. You know, we can, we can reach out to you. If you have a list of people, maybe this is something that you can send and we can write, we can correspond. I, ca I can be on first first term um, ready to, to answer. I've done, I've done something like that. You've done it in Fiji and uh, in uh, Polynesia, wherever. And I was, for instance, with the, uh, um, the, the, the World Health Organization in Sudan in 2011. It was for a month 
helping the Sudan ministry, which was, uh, they had very, very pre well prepared people because they, they're people that have trained in, in England, etc. So I was there for a month to help prepare medical education for their nurses, midwives, uh, GPs. And I, I visited a, a university out in the out in the field, you know, out in the desert, you know, about 400 miles from Khartoum. It wasn't it wasn't an easy to, easy trip, but it was nice. Yeah, so I mean, I have experience. So this is something I think. My advice: Let's reach out to each other. We can give. Well, you have an address. You have if you have an organization of people, they can write to us or to me personally. There's no problem. I'd be very happy. Well, I think what your organization is doing is fantastic. It's vitally important. And I wanted to thank you so much for being part of our show today. Well, thank you, Kevin. Thank you very much. The Emerging Therapeutics Summit covers what is new in emerging technologies and innovations over the next five years that will impact the practice of cardiac electrophysiology. With case-based roundtables, lectures, and panel discussions involving leading experts who are at the cutting edge of innovation, research, and development of novel therapeutic approaches for the treatment of heart rhythm disorders. Let's take a closer look. HRS is turning 40 years this year, and that is such a great time, I think, to look back a little bit on how many things we have achieved over the last 40 years and how many exciting things I think we are going to achieve over the next 40 years. So the timing was right for a summit that specifically looked at where we're going. You know, look at exciting new technology that's coming our way. This, the, that's what we're hoping to see with the Emerging Technology Summit. So I think we're going to see a lot of new and exciting, not just technology coming our way in the next five years, but I'd like to think that we are going to make progress in just an overall patient management from an electrophysiology standpoint, and that incorporates everything from the Digital Health Summit, which really looks at um, patient management in, 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 in a new era of, of incorporating digital health into medical records and into patient management, and taking that to the next step, which is how do we treat the patients? What kind of new procedures and technology will we have for ablation procedures? Pacemakers, leadless pacemakers, uh, that's an example of something that I think really has taken pacing to a whole new level. I think it's really important to have a summit that, that looks ahead. Because sometimes we can sit back and we say, hey, 40 years of HRS and pat ourselves on the shoulder and say we're, we're doing so well. And we are doing well, but we need to look in the future and we need to stay with the times and we need to stay current. And the only way we do that is by getting together as, as a big group speakers, chairmen, audience, everyone there to, to talk and discuss and learn from each other. And that's really what we hope to see from these summits. Chiba University is a national Japanese institution located about a one-hour drive east of Tokyo. Chiba University Hospital was established in 1874 for the purpose of cardiac rhythm management. They established the Department of Advanced Cardiorhythm Therapeutics. And now, let's take a closer look at all the work they are doing. Chiba University is located one hour drive east of Tokyo in Chiba Prefecture. Chiba University Hospital was established in 1874 for the purpose of special rhythm management based on the highest standards of academic medicine. We established the Department of Advanced Cardiorhythm Therapeutics. We strive to provide the tailor-made catheter ablation therapies. Atrial fibrillation is the most common arrhythmia that we encounter here at Chiba University Hospital. To treat AF, we use three different ablation technologies, including laser balloon. 
We check the anatomy of the pulmonary veins using enhanced CT before each procedure. Today, in most proximal RF cases, we perform laser balloon ablation. It is one of the latest technologies which can achieve a highly accurate and safe therapeutic effect for various anatomies. In persistent AF, we identify the atrial substrates using a new mapping catheter, HD grid with the Enzyme Navic system. It is our mission to become one of the leaders in Asia by adopting advanced ablation technologies and offering the highest standard of care to our patients. As one of the limited heart transplantation centers and high volume ICD centers, we provide optimal cardiac device therapies. One of the major missions of our team is to provide optimal treatment for life-threatening RCMEs. So we perform implantation of the latest ICD and the CRT solutions for all types of patients with various conditions. Recently introduced subcutaneous ICD became a good option, especially for young patients or those who have no upper transvenous access route. Intermuscular implantation of SICD enables us to infiltrate the device into even smaller bodied Asian patients. Furthermore, a great cooperation with the anesthesiology department is critical and which helps us to achieve the optimal outcome for implantation with minimal pain. In addition, we conduct in vivo experiments aiming to develop novel ICD therapies such as combined therapy of SICD and the leader pacemaker, or new ICD settings for patients with higher defibrillation threshold. Our challenge is ongoing, however, it is very rewarding. We provide the best possible treatment with lethal arrhythmias, involving not only expert physicians, but also nurses and clinical engineers who specialize in arrhythmias. We actively use remote monitoring system for our ICD patients. Because some patients are active, this portable transmitter, Cardio Messenger Smart, makes a significant contribution to the heart failure management. Cardio Messenger Smart has been improved to be portable based on our input and now is used around the world. When an alert is received by email, the clinical engineer will immediately check the content on the web. Report it to our doctor through SNS, and the nurse will contact the patient. A workflow has been constructed based on the in-time trial, and the result of our research demonstrates an improved prognosis for the patient. As an academic research center, we immerse ourselves in basic research and clinical studies. Recent studies have shown that there is a relationship between atrial fibrillation and asymptomatic cerebral ischemia. So we designed the SCARF registry to investigate the incidence of cerebral vascular disease, cognitive dysfunction, and dementia in patients with atrial fibrillation. This is a prospective multi-center study in which we aim to enroll 200 patients with non-barbara atrial fibrillation and 100 without atrial fibrillation. This is the ongoing registry, and now we are recruiting patients. Patients undergo MRI and they are assessed by cognitive function test at the baseline and two years later. We hope that the results from this study contribute to further improvement of AF management, especially anticoagulation therapy and better quality of life. We welcome the patients from abroad and willing to collaborate internationally with researchers and physicians and hopefully Chiba University can become one of the leading institutions worldwide. It's all for the patients. Allied health professionals are a crucial part of the EP care team. These highly skilled professionals make it possible to effectively deliver the right care for our patients with heart rhythm disorders. Let's take a deep dive into the current state of allied health professionals. Today, I'm with Jill Schaefer, who is a nurse practitioner with the Heart Group. Jill, welcome to the show. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. Well, tell me a little bit about why you think it's so important for allied health professionals to be involved in the Heart Rhythm Society? 
Well, it's good news that we um, are 25% of our membership. The membership is growing. And I think that this is a professional home for people in the EP community. Uh, there's unparalleled education, sessions, research, and an opportunity for allied professionals to really see the whole team in action. And I think that's one of the great assets that HRS gives our EP allied professionals. You know, I understand that you are a newly minted member of the Board of Trustees here at HRS. Tell me what you hope to accomplish as an allied health professional representative on our Board of Trustees. Well, it's an exciting time to be involved in that level of planning. As we know, EP is growing and innovations keep coming at us faster than we can keep up with it. So I'm really pleased to uh, be a voice uh, for the allied professionals at the board level. So it's a very exciting time. Tell me what you think, um, you know, the state of the union for allied health professionals is now. What's going on? What's the current status? Folks working to the top of their license is a common theme that I hear, but I think everyone is like super busy. Every year we come here and we say we're busy, 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 and every year it seems to be worse than before. So tendencies on how we do our work efficiently, how we stay patient-centric. Uh, patients, uh, you know, we're dealing with technologies that are more patient-facing, and the allied professionals are sometimes on the front line of that um, and uh, they have concerns and how we best manage our workflows is a common theme that we hear and again our new allied professional council we had one year in we hope to help solidify those processes for folks and listen and give folks what they need. If you had to kind of break it down to what is the biggest challenge facing allied health professionals today both within electrophysiology and outside more globally what, what would that be? defining workflows and license issues to be able to work in concert with the team but to the level of our training and appropriate use of allied professionals in a team-based spirit I think is something that's important. Each state has different laws and that kind of changes, you know, a job is different depending. So I think that's one of the big challenges that um, allied health professionals, both nursing, nurse practitioners, physician assistants are working on. Even our um, genetic counselors are in our allied professional community. So making our work more patient-centric. So what do you think the biggest opportunities for allied health professionals, both within the society and more globally in your practice are in 2020? I, I think the biggest challenges and the biggest opportunities are to stay educated. You know, we sometimes get on the treadmill of life and see patients, but it's sometimes hard to keep up with all of the research and things. So I think uh, challenges and opportunities are how to stay connected as a as a group um, and to be able to use innovation to stay connected, stay educated. This is a hard field in electrophysiology to onboard and to learn. As we always say in our practice, nurse practitioners, especially EP ones, don't grow on trees. It's not a part of our training. So we spend a lot of time and effort on uh, helping folks. And every time at our sessions, folks come in and say, well, where do you go for EKG changing? How do we enhance our digital footprint to have opportunities for people across the globe that help with that. How we can help our global partners is also a, a big challenge that this society takes seriously. You know, I think that's a great point because we at HRS are a international global society yes. and we've got to make sure that we take care of mm -hmm. the entire world. So we do. Thank you so much for being thank here. You. It was great to have you on the show. Thank you very much. Baptist Health Lexington is the first of its kind in Kentucky, dedicated to the diagnosis and treatment of heart disease and valvular heart disorders. Baptist Health Lexington is improving quality of life by providing state-of-the-art clinical studies, providing access to new technologies that patients would not normally be able to receive. Let's take a closer look.
The mission of Baptist Health Lexington is to provide the highest quality of care for patients in the most compassionate manner. More specifically, our goal is to improve patient clinical outcomes, reduce their hospitalization rates, but most importantly, enhance their quality of life. So here at Baptist Health Lexington Cardiology, we have an exceptional team of cardiologists, electrophysiologists, advanced practice practitioners, pharmacists, clinical coordinators, and device care specialists that are each involved daily in the patient's heart failure treatment. Dr. Tomasoni started the research program in 1999, and we've been doing heart failure clinical trials since then. He's been involved with clinical trial research from the beginning of, in the developing of device trials. We have then grown to where we are now offering multiple trials for different types of heart failure patients. So patients are encouraged to call with any symptoms in between their normal cardiac visit. If patients are having symptoms, we want them to be seen in the heart and valve center instead of going to the hospital setting or the ED visit for unnecessary visits. So they will call, they may receive IV diuretics. The appointments are set up to be in a timely manner. So if patients are having concerns, they'll be seen the same day or within the next 72 hours. Heart failure is a progressive condition that results in structural and functional impairment of the left ventricle to fill and pump blood. These problems are many times very complex and requires multiple levels of care, including outreach clinics where we go out to these patients closer to their home, traveling up to 120 miles away from our private hospital location to provide additional care for these patients. So heart failure is an extremely common problem here in Kentucky. Um, especially for our population 65 and older. Approximately 35% of those heart failure patients qualify for cardiac resynchronization therapy devices. And of those, about 70% will have improved symptoms and quality of life. That other 30%, we then have to go back and look and see what other factors that we can modify, whether it's medications or arrhythmias or even potential more research. Currently, our research interest is in left atrial function, and the left atrial function that we're looking at is risk of blood clots that can form from left atrial dysfunction. We also have an interest in left atrial-based anatomy to prevent the risk of complications during AFib ablations. We're also doing research and laser lead removals to decrease the risk associated with complications during the procedures. Research is a critical component in patient care because it offers patients a chance to receive new technology that they would not be able to normally receive. By receiving that new technology, there is a high likelihood that they'll improve in their overall symptoms and enjoy life. Heart failure research has expanded over the years through the different types of devices offered to them. In the beginning we were looking at bi biventricular pacing and now we are actually looking at those non-responding patients to biventricular pacing. We've also been able to improve through the trials by offering those patients who have failed medicinal trials or medicinal treatments and providing them an opportunity for longer life through new improved devices. Presently, we are implanting many different type of cardiac resynchronization therapy devices. These devices will improve quality of life and also improve longevity. There are newer trials that are looking at newer left ventricular lead therapies as well as cardiac stimulation to improve the efficiency of the heart muscle, ultimately improving the symptoms of these patients. Currently, the CRT devices that we favor are the ones that have multi-point pacing abilities because we do prefer to use multi-point pacing as much as we can as we've had a very good responder rate by using the most latest pacing algorithms. Since 1999, our EP research program has enrolled hundreds of patients to clinical trials devoted to studying the future of device trials. I sought treatment uh, originally because I was having some heart issues. They managed the care after my device was put in by seeing me on a regular basis and also continuing to do some tests to monitor not only how the device was doing, but how my heart was performing. Since I received the device, my heart condition has improved uh, to the point where I've been able to continue the lifestyle that I've enjoyed up to this point. I think the doctors and the staff have provided me with absolutely the best care that I could ever imagine. I have full faith and trust in everybody that I've worked with here. Atrial fibrillation was the diagnosis. 
Dr. Tomasoni said, I don't think the uh, uh, cauterization would work, would help you. But he told me about the procedure with the uh, pacemaker. The, uh, the procedure was a breeze. Dr. Tomasoni is a genius. I've had no problems. My heart condition has been perfect since I received the pacemaker. When they come back and see you and their quality of life has improved, it's an amazing feeling. And primarily, that's the reason why we continue to do what we do. It's not only because of all the new technology and all the new research, but we do it for the patient, to see them improve their quality of life and the way they feel on a daily basis. Recognized provincially, nationally, and internationally as a leader in quality, innovation, and research in the treatment and management of electrical abnormalities of the heart, the Heart Rhythm Program at the South Lake Regional Health Center serves patients in areas of northern Ontario. Let's take a closer look. The main mission of the Heart Rhythm Program at South Lake Regional Health Center is to provide world-class heart rhythm care close to home for our patients in York Region, Simcoe Region, and Muskoka Regions. Traditionally in Canada, um, all the electrophysiology services were uh, centered in the downtown teaching hospitals. And in terms of decentralizing care, uh, once South Lake um, decided that they were going to become a regional cardiac center, it was our opinion that you could not be a full service cardiac program without having electrophysiology services. So it was our intent to start an electrophysiology program in the community outside of a standard university teaching center to bring services to the region. Previously our patients used to have to travel long distances all the way to downtown Toronto to receive these services, which is inconvenient and not the best patient care. So for us to be able to provide world class cutting edge uh, procedures close to home was a big change for the Canadian environment and uh, for our patients purposes of not being able to access the technologies and the treatments available we thought it was most appropriate to bring it to the community rather than bring the community to the service. Southern Hospital has been for quite a few years already a model of um, innovation and good care. I joined to South Lake program a few years ago and my first shock was I was impressed how much I can produce. So like I walk into a procedure room and I was able to do two or three times more work that I used to do on my own. And, and then I realized, well, the team helps uh, working with uh, very high skilled nurses and technicians and with the state of the art technology, things really make me fly through and that really make an amazing experience for my career. We implant uh, defibrillators and pacemakers as well as cardiac resynchronization devices. We do approximately 1,500 of these devices all encompassing per year. The home monitoring program pioneered here at South Lake is an amazing program by which our patients are able to have monitoring at home without having to commute to South Lake. Patients live very far away at times, sometimes two to three hours commute to have their devices checked otherwise. We recently developed three new state-of-the-art cardiac electrophysiology labs which are capable of accommodating both implants as well as ablations and these labs are stocked with absolutely state-of-the-art technologies. Since starting at South Lake 15 years ago, we have been lucky to be at the forefront of development in electrophysiology. We were the first center worldwide to use uh, CARTO sound, integrative uh, ultrasound, in men. Uh, we also were one of the first centers to work with new technologies such as the Genesis mesh balloon for ablation of atrial fibrillation, as well as the PVAC catheters were one of the first centers to use in North America. We always look to innovate, we always look to improve on the success and efficiency of the procedures uh, that we perform 
We want to improve patient experience, uh, make sure that we achieve long-lasting success in ablation of atrial fibrillation and other arrhythmias such as ventricular tachycardia, and, uh, et cetera, and make sure that we do a good job looking after uh, our patients in our region and in Ontario. As our program grew in terms of numbers of procedures, and as we had access to newer technologies, we started to develop our own homegrown research, mostly of clinical trials and other clinical projects, which have generated a lot of significant peer-reviewed publications. Our STAR AF2 trial, for example, was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and our ongoing OCEAN trial will finally answer whether AF ablation can reduce the risk of stroke. We are very proud to be part of the South Lake Regional Health Center Heart Rhythm Program. We are proud of our accomplishments, but we're also very excited about what we're going to do in the future for the care of our patients. Well, that's it for us today, but we certainly hope you've enjoyed today's show. Remember, we'll be back tomorrow with more exclusive reports about the latest here at the 40th Annual Heart Rhythm Scientific Sessions. <laughs>